Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, dans mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, dans mon jardin d'hiver. You weren't there either, George. Well, I've read the reports. We've seen the testimony. You've seen some reporting. Te- you've, seen leak, no. you've seen leaked reporting from Democrats. That's right, George. Some of the testimony has also been released by those who uh, the witnesses themselves. And of course, the State Department is not complying with some of the subpoena uh, with some of the subpoenas for documents as well. And, and, and we do know that so much of and this is by his own admission that so much of this activity was being carried out by the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Was he acting with your blessing and supervision? George, I had one consistent policy as the Secretary of State to not talk about internal deliberations inside the administration. I'm not going to change that policy for you here this morning. But, but this was different. This was not a member of the administration. This is the president's personal lawyer who was pursuing this as at the president's uh, direction and, and going around the, the normal State Department procedures. George, private citizens often... Uh, are part of uh, executing American foreign policy. You know that. You you lived that. Uh, uh, let, let's, well, you want to talk about Sidney Blumenthal for a while, George? Let's go. I can go. I can go Mr. all day, Mr. Secretary. Of course, there have been special envoys of course for there presidents have. in of the past. Of course, there have. There've they been private citizens have, all the time, George. They, that's all true. The time. Bill Richardson does this kind of work all the time. There's lots of good patriotic Americans who are working, trying to deliver and assist the State Department, the Department of Energy, all of the elements of American power to get good outcomes for the American people. And they this, get, is, this is and, completely. And they, they generally have formal appointments. They generally go through reviews for conflicts of interest. We now know that Rudy Giuliani, Mayor Giuliani, the president's personal lawyer, was pursuing business interests in the Ukraine at the time he was acting as the president's special envoy. Doesn't that create at least the appearance of a conflict of interest? George, I, I miss Sidney Blumenthal's conflict of interest clearance. You, you must have seen that, and I did not. Was there a review of the conflicts for Mayor Giuliani? George, I, I don't talk about internal White House deliberations. We do know that he that Mayor Giuliani, the president's personal materials from Ukraine, and pass it on to you through the White House. What did you do with it? That's true. I uh, I received a, a set of materials. It was in a sealed envelope. I passed it on to the appropriate persons inside the State Department for their review. I never reviewed them. You didn't look at them. I did not. So, did you know what Rudy Giuliani was doing? I, George, I don't talk about internal deliberations inside the administration. He said publicly, and there's been corroborating testimony from several others, including some of the people you worked with in the State Department and the Foreign Service, that he pushed hard for the removal of Ambassador Marie Ivanovich uh, from Ukraine, from her post as Ambassador to Ukraine, circulated a series of false, what she called even defamatory charges against her. Were you aware of that? George, let's talk about Ambassador Ivanovich for just a minute. Uh, she was... Uh, Uh, withdrawn from her post uh, a handful of weeks early. She still works at the State Department. She's a Foreign Service officer in good standing. Uh, uh, You know this, George. Ambassadors serve at the pleasure of the president. And when a a president loses confidence in ambassador, it's not in that ambassador. The State Department or America's best interest for them continue to stay in their post. She testified, and she put out this testimony, that in late April she met with the Deputy Secretary of State, John Sullivan, who told her she was being removed even though she did nothing wrong. That's a quote. Why did you approve the removal of an ambassador who had done nothing wrong? 
George, again, I, I'm not going to get into personnel matters inside the State Department. I, I've not done it, and I'm not going to do it for you here this morning. But, but, but sir, if she, she's saying that she is being defamed because of this. She said that, that uh, she was also told that there had been a pressure campaign, and that Deputy Secretary Sullivan said there had been a pressure campaign since the summer of 2018 against her, led by the president. And, and, and many uh, who have observed this, many Foreign Service professionals say that you have a duty to speak up for her, that you had a duty to protect her in that position. George, in good time, all of the facts have become clear, uh, but it's not appropriate for me to comment on uh, all of the things that happen inside of personnel decisions. None, none of our Foreign Service officers would welcome the Secretary of State talking about why someone stayed, why someone was removed, why someone was transferred. It wouldn't be appropriate. If we get into it once, we've got to get into why it everyone, it George. And I, I just won't do that, George. But, 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 but sir, if, if, someone is, if, some, if false things are being said about one of your pre professionals, don't you have a duty to stand up and speak out on behalf of that professional? George, no, no Secretary of State has defended its team, its team members has done things that served them well, that took care of their families, that made sure that they were getting promotions. We have, by the end of this year, more foreign, servicers on, foreign service officers on duty than at any time, any time, George, a couple hundred years of the State Department, at any time in the State Department's history. We've done great things for these officers. Uh, I see these stories about morale being low. I see things precisely the opposite. I see motivated officers. I watched them perform in Syria this week. I've watched them perform in difficult situations during my year and a half as Secretary of State. I'm incredibly proud of the work that they've done, and I will always defend them when it's appropriate. It is Monday, the 21st of October of 2019, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is River City Hash Mondays. That's right, uh, we have to slice and dice all of that from over the weekend. And uh, because we do, we, we repurpose it and uh, put out a rather uh, gourmet dish here on Mondays for you. Nancy Pelosi has gone to Jordan. Donald Trump is really mad about that. Well, you know, she's got to go over there and clean up the mess. And of course, while she was there, her 90-year-old brother passed away. So she's doing the work for the American people. Donald Trump is, well, Donald Trump. And then we have all of the machine robots on social media. And then we also have, let's not forget, there were 60-some-odd million people who voted for Donald Trump. All of them were not bots. There is still a sizable number there. Okay, let's not forget that. And they don't want you to forget it one iota. No, they don't. The uh, trader bots, troll bots, machine bots have been out in force over the weekend. Uh, now... <laughs> As I set up this this particular rant, let me preface it by saying that I'm always astounded how the brainwashing works. Because Hillary Clinton, for, let's be clear, four plus decades, the right-wing media, the right-wing conspiracy, the right-wing machine, has been working in overdrive for all those decades with the anti-Clinton bias, the anti-Clinton BS bias. It's a BS. And why is that? Because Hillary Clinton sat on the Watergate investigative committee as a staffer. And then she and her husband, Bill, rose to the seats of power. We were the hippies. And hippies are only there to be kicked, not to run the United States. Not only were they hippies, but they impeached their hero, Richard Nixon. And I got to tell you, in their minds, they still maintain Richard Nixon didn't do anything different than every other politician. He's just the one that got caught. This machine has been arrayed against Hillary Clinton with the most ridiculously stupid conspiracy theories in the world. I mean, the wa Whitewater conspiracy, the Whitewater issue. It's another one of those weird, yeah, you have to like, I, I don't know how you can get your brain to wrap around it. People do. 
I still hear about how corrupt Whitewater was. Whitewater was a failed land deal. They lost ten thousand dollars in those in that decade's money. So it's, they lost more in today's money. It was a failed land deal, and yet the conspiracy goes. Apparently, they used their positions of power to secure a land deal that failed, and that shows their corruption. For instance. <laughs> So now I'm we're still talking about her emails and yet the New York Times that had uh when Comey came out about the emails and whenever the guy from Clinton Cash talked about Schweitzer Swiker uh got picked up by uh, uh the New York Times and and uh, spread his lies about Clinton in, in the Clinton Cash uh, mode that was his book and uh, how corrupt she was, and these emails are a national security threat on the front page for, you know, ad nauseum. And over the weekend, State Department once again found that none of those emails had any criminal activity. There was no intent to hide them because they were never hidden. They were turned over for the president or the Records Act, not presidential, but the Records Act. And uh, now we're supposed to wrap our heads around some weird conspiracy that Hillary, like this, this Whitewater land deal, okay? Somehow Hillary colluded, conspired with Vlad, who hates her, by the way, and why? Because when he invaded the Ukraine, she is uh, Secretary of State, pushed to have sanctions put on them for violating international law. OK, he hates her. But somehow in this conspiracy that Pompeo and Barr, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, are traveling around the country. I mean, around the country, traveling around the world to fix. Is that somehow that collusion with Vlad to get Hillary to lose so that they could do something to Trump. And all of the evidence is on a server, the DNC, the the missing DNC server that is in Ukraine. There is no missing DNC server. The DNC servers were given to the FBI and the FBI gave them back to the DNC. They're in the DNC offices in Washington, D.C. as I speak. They're not missing. But if you tell a lie enough, and the bigger the lie, and the louder and most, most, more vociferous that you say that lie, the more people are going to believe it. So over the weekend, we have these trader bots, troll bots, and machine bots attacking liberal Democrats and some of these trader bots purport to be liberals and Democrats. They just want Hillary to go away because she said something bad about Tulsi. She called Tulsi a Russian asset. She never called Tulsi a Russian asset. She called Jill Stein a Russian asset. It's even on tape. She implied, intimated that Tulsi Gabbard is a Russian asset. She never named Tulsi initially, I granted. I mean, she could have met that Goop Williamson. One of the trader bots said, a, tra a trader bot that purports to be a liberal Democrat, sure. It just, you know, Hillary. She, she always disrespects women and gave a list of the women that she's disrespected. Apparently, she disrespected Kamala, disrespected Elizabeth Warren, disrespected, you know, uh, uh, Klobuchar. Etc. 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 Which is a lie, but <laughs> I I th I thought maybe you know if it's not Tulsi, it could be that Williamson. You never know. <laughs> and if Tulsi is not an asset, she's a dupe or an idiot. And it's pretty damn rich. Tulsi accusing Hillary Clinton of being a warmonger. I'm still trying to wrap my head around what war did Hillary ever declare? <laughs> How is she a warmonger? 
yeah, I got the traitor bots giving me all this weird stuff from RT about how Hillary's State Department pushed for war. Yeah, I think that it was because Vlad illegally went into the Ukraine and confiscated their property. And if there's one thing Americans should understand, it's property rights. Private property rights. (laughs) And uh, once uh, Vlad starts uh, doing eminent domain on yours, we'll see how you like it. We hope to never come to that, but it may be happening right now. (laughs) I'm serious with all this Russian money being laundered here for Trump land deals. Anyway. I had to put up with these trader bots uh, spamming my Twitter feed, let alone just the constant harangue on Facebook. Boy, Zuck. You know, I still can't get to my son's uh, closed down account that we were using in the months before he died. And uh, but but Mitt Romney can have a couple of accounts. (laughs) <laughs> Donald Trump, oh my God, and every single Trump bro, LaRouche, and Ron Paul acolyte is given sucker, and somehow the liberal Democratic members of these groups are locked out. Yeah, there's this one trader bot that came in, purports to be working at San Onofre. I've mentioned this fellow before. I think it's a fellow. Fellows. And was reported. No online presence anywhere. San Onofre is closed. They have a skeleton crew, and we know who they are. There's only employee records. Jeez. Well, somehow, this trader bot was able to get into a closed private group. And once they were in there, all of a sudden, the group is filled up with a a bunch of accounts from Saudi Arabia. What's that all about? Saudi Arabia. And uh, one by one, they're blocking all the liberal Democrats because we keep bringing up, like, what the hell are these traitor bot machine bots doing in a private group? How did they get here? Reported it to Zuck. Zuck said, meh, meh. And then we find out how much Zuckerberg has been helped with uh, Russian help (laughs) from the very beginning. And this guy didn't take one humanities class, and I bet you he never had an American civics class either. I bet you. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, of course, Pompeo. What can you say about Pompeo? Well, most anything, and it would be correct, especially if you're taking into task. On the rest of the menu, border agents are patrolling hospitals to find sick immigrants to deport because they can't run away when they're sick. The GOP advanced another ultra-conservative Trump judicial pick who has almost no legal experience. Well, if you're deconstructing the administrative state, do you really need to be a lawyer to do that? Jeez. And the EPA kept its West Coast team out of the loop as Trump's feud with California escalated. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where at least four people were killed and scores injured in Bangladesh over a Facebook post that offended Muslims. And now there's going to be a Facebook post that offends Hindus, and they'll be killing a bunch of Muslims. And in a rare show of unity by the usually tribal media, Australian newspapers have united in protest against the government's recent extreme media restrictions. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. To the rightish of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of the page from the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is our link to our Patreon page. And do please become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio. We have become masters over this eight-year run and counting of stretching dollars beyond all compare. So your generosity has allowed us to continue resisting as the founders of this great nation originally intended. You know, it doesn't take much, just uh, maybe the cost of a of a uh, espresso-type coffee drink sent our way once a month. Mm-hmm. And we have been able to take those monies that uh, has come our way and uh, mitigate paying our bills. And, of course, we have to get newish machinery inching along with the ones we got now. I hope they last until we can identify uh, a workhorse to take over and get all the attendant software installed. Ouch. So, once again, thank you for your generosity in allowing us to uh, do all of this that's called Netroots Radio. You can follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. It's so simple because Tom takes care of that. You can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. And I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Codes about 10 minutes before showtime. And uh, then get that linked up, on, linked up on social media. I'll get it out. It's Monday. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. All right, let's get into this first offering here. It comes out of Share Blue Media. And um, it is, oh, it is by the Associated Press by way of Share Blue Media. An armed Border Patrol agent roamed the hallways of an emergency room in Miami on a recent day as nurses wheeled stretchers and medical carts through the hospital and families waited for physicians to treat their loved ones. The agent, in the olive green uniform, freely stepped in and out of the room where a woman was taken by ambulance after throwing up and fainting while being detained on an immigration violation. The presence of immigration authorities is becoming increasingly common at healthcare facilities around the country, and hospitals are struggling with where to draw the line to protect patients' rights amid rising immigration enforcement in the Trump administration. Some doctors say this is this increased presence could undermine public health in cities with large immigrant populations, frightening patients who need care and prompting them to avoid hospitals. Well, (laughs) has anybody ever met Stephen Miller? And even if you haven't, don't you know who the hell he is? All of this is a feature, not a bug. Normally, immigration and customs enforcement officers and Border Patrol agents enter hospitals when detainees require emergency medical services or specialized care. In many cases, agents escort sick immigrants to the hospital after apprehending them at the border. In some instances, they have detained them after leaving a hospital. In 2017, Border Patrol agents followed a 10-year-old immigrant with cerebral palsy to a Texas hospital and took her into custody after surgery. She had been brought to the U.S. from Mexico when she was a toddler. Well, obviously, she's illegal then, isn't she? Doctors, lawyers, and family members have complained about immigrants being shackled in hospitals and intrusive presence of uniformed agents in exam rooms during treatment and discussions with physicians about medical care. The American Medical Association Journal of Ethics devoted its entire January issue to medical care for immigrants who are in the country without papers, including a discussion of whether medical facilities should declare themselves sanctuary hospitals. Our patients should not fear that entering a hospital will result in arrest or deportation in medical facilities Patients and families should be focused on recovery and their health, not the ramifications of their immigration status, the
the association said in a statement. Dr. Elizabeth Porman, a primary care physician at the University of Washington in, U- in Seattle, says facilities need to constantly train staff on how to interact with law enforcement and immigrant patients in these situations. The ground is constantly shifting. I can tell the patient I am committed to your safety, she said, but in the current administration, we cannot tell everyone they are 100% safe. Earlier this year, the agency that oversees Border Patrol said its agents averaged 69 trips to the hospital each day across the country. In the first half of the year, the federal government said Border Patrol agents had spent 150,300,000 hours monitoring detained people at hospitals. That's about the equivalent of 20,000 eight-hour shifts spent at hospitals. Hospitals, schools, and places of worship are considered sensitive locations by a government policy and are generally free from immigration enforcement, but the rule is discretionary and ambiguous when an enforcement action begins before a trip to the hospital or when an immigrant is already in custody. Now, these Border Patrol agents and ICE agents have been caught on security tape and audio in hospitals with doctors and nurses and patients asking for a warrant. And each and every one are on video and tape and surveillance cameras saying, we don't need one. Healthcare lawyers and medical associations say providers generally should not allow law enforcement unrestricted access to treatment areas to comply with HIPAA laws. And, of course, we know that law protects against improper disclosure of confidential information that may result from offering such access. Spokesman for New York City Health and Hospitals, which operates the public hospitals and clinics, said that when patients show up in custody of immigration enforcement, officers would be posted outside the treatment room, the same way it happens with police officers. But hospitals have yet to come up with a universal set of policies on how medical staff and physicians interact with immigration authorities. Dr. Porman said she hopes that hospitals start doing more on the issue. There is a lack of courage from the hospital systems to really acknowledge what is happening to our patients in this country. Lisa Needham of Share Blue Media brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. Another unqualified Donald Trump judicial pick, Justin Waka, is making his way through the Senate. And given the makeup of the Senate and the GOP's unyielding commitment to agreeing to any of Trump's nominees, no matter how unfit, there's every reason to believe he'll be confirmed. His nomination just cleared the Judiciary Committee in the Senate with unanimous support from the GOP in spite of his lack of qualifications. Well, it has been posited in wider circles than this small little silo here that it is the mere lack of qualifications that is the only qualification you need to be a judge on a high court in the United States of America during the Trump era. How else can you deconstruct the administrative state? Walker, who Trump nominated to the federal bench for the Western District of Kentucky, is only 37 years old, which means he could be on the federal bench for 40 years or more. He doesn't bring any real experience to the court, but he does bring modern conservative credentials, and that's all you need. He was instrumental in discrediting Dr. Christine Blasey Ford during the confirmation hearings for Kavanaugh. During those hearings, Walker did over 70 media hits 
to defend Kavanaugh and attack Ford. Now he gets to be a judge. His defense of Kavanaugh is not surprising. Walker clerked for Kavanaugh. And then he went to, on to clerk for, at the Supreme Court for Anthony Kennedy. That might sound impressive on its face, but Clark, but Walker <laughs> didn't really ever practice law after his clerkships. That's in large part why the ABA, the American Bar Association, which rates all federal judicial picks, declared Walker not qualified to serve on the bench. His actual legal resume is embarrassingly thin. When he filled out the Senate Judiciary Questionnaire, he was forced to admit he has never served as sole or chief counsel in any case tried to verdict or judgment. He did go on to say that he had been an associate counsel at one federal criminal jury trial. He got to sit and hand out papers. Typically, the ABA looks for at least 12 years of trial or litigation experience. In the case of Walker, the ABA said it was challenging to determine how much of his 10 years since graduation from law school has been in the practice of law and that he lacked any significant trial experience. In contrast to the nonpartisan ABA, Senate Majority Leader Moscow Mitch McConnell has tried to characterize Trump's pick of Walker as unquestionably the most outstanding nomination that I've ever recommended to presidents to serve on the bench in Kentucky. While Walker doesn't have any experience that would warrant him serving on the federal bench, he does have substantial experience pushing Republican talking points. He hates Obamacare. He penned an article for the ultra-conservative Federalist Society arguing that Kavanaugh should be confirmed because he also reliably hated the ACA. He doesn't want federal agencies to use their powers to protect workers or the environment, and he's previously called himself a tax-cutting Iraq-invading Republican. This administration offers favors ideology over experience, and Walker is just the latest example. Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the New York Times by Lisa Friedman. When the EPA administrator Andrew Wheeler accused California of allowing, quote, piles of human feces, end quote, on city streets to contaminate sewer systems, leaders of the agency's West Coast region hastily convened an all-hands meeting of the San Francisco staff. At that meeting, EPA EPA officials informed staff members that Wheeler's torrent of allegations about the state's water pollution were exaggerated, according to five current and former EPA officials briefed on internal discussions. Moreover, the accusations uh, contained in the September 26 oversight letter had been developed without the knowledge of the California-based staff, which would normally issue such notices. Instead, it was put together by a small group of political appointees in Washington assigned specifically to target California. Senior leaders of the agency defended the process. Oh, senior leaders, you mean like political senior leaders? Who were pointing to legitimate issues with California's air quality and water systems. Oh, you mean the ones that are more stringent than the federal policies? And so you want to take California's ability to have those stringent regulations away? Unlike previous administrations that were complacent with noncompliance, this administration will not let these serious environmental failures languish. And that was Michael Stoker, 
the administrator of EPA Region 9, which includes California. He added that he was unaware of Mr. Wheeler's letter before it went out and agreed that it was warranted. Oh, really? You were unaware? I would probably presume in some way that this is a gross abuse of power. When you're using the levers of power in the administration to exact revenge on your enemies, even if they're whole states. The unusual manner in which Wheeler's accusations were compiled and delivered bolsters suspicions voiced by Governor Gavin Newsom of California and others that this Trump administration is retaliating against California, a liberal state that has consistently defied the president's deregulation agenda. In recent weeks, the Trump administration has fought bitterly with California over immigration, the Trump's tax returns and homelessness. But nowhere are the complaints more jarring and the threats more specific than in the environmental arena, where nationwide the Trump administration has been easing off enforcement. Critics of the administration have accused EPA officials in Washington of clamping down on environmental standards in California while averting their gaze from similar or worse situations elsewhere. There is no question here that the administration is targeting California because, ironically, California has played an outsized role as an aggressive regulator. Richard Lazarus, professor of environmental law at Harvard University, said tensions between the state and the federal government have increased sharply in recent months, aggravated by a feud over California's authority under the Clean Air Act to set automobile emission standards that are stricter than those of the federal government. California officials struck a deal in July with four automakers willing to abide by the state's tougher gas mileage standards, and that enraged Donnie Duma. The EPA then formally revoked California's authority, which triggered a lawsuit from the state and 13 others. And in the weeks that followed, the Trump administration made a series of increasingly severe accusations against the state, including the September 26 letter that accused California of failing to meet clean water standards and hundreds of, quote, deficiencies that have led to public health concerns. Well, there's a long list that the feds have come up with, but coincidentally, and maybe even conveniently in the Vladian meaning of the word, California EPA officials and staff, career staff, were just conveniently left out of the loop because they know the truth. They do. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we are going to go through weather from around the world and finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, whom is this joke on? This Take Two has spoilers because I want to talk about the racial slash ethnic aspect of Joker. So, when our protagonist Arthur is about to transform into Joker, the speech he gives on the Murray Franklin show is about how the world is a horrible joke, that people are rude and mean, and they kick you when you're down. Art's response to this world is to embrace his resentment and his emotional disabilities and strike back fatally. Put a pin in that. Joker starts by showing us Arthur's world. After being jumped by a group of Latinos, he's surrounded by African Americans. Gotham turns out to be the blackest city on the eastern seaboard, as setup after setup has African Americans in the background. In the foreground are his social worker, the rude woman on the bus, his fantasy girlfriend, the clerk at Arkham, and his doctor at Arkham. All of these characters judge Arthur and deny him successful integration into society. The other significant group in Arthur's world is Jews. His boss at the clown agency, not explicit, but coded. The comedian in the club, De Niro's Murray Franklin, and Franklin's manager, again, coded. Most of these people are in positions to frustrate Arthur's successful creative and professional development. 
Gotham does have a white non-Jewish world, it's Arthur and his mom, and a world of money and power and position that Arthur wants to belong to, but is ultimately cruelly rejected from. What are we to take from what seems to be a carefully constructed racial-slash-ethnic palette? Is Joker meant to celebrate the struggle of the lower-class white male against people of color, Jews, family emasculation, and rich whites? Do we cheer, as the final crowd does, masked and thus race-free, his move to murder? Well, the problem is Arthur has mental disorders. He can't control his reaction to his environment, and thus we can neither cheer nor blame him, right? All I know is after two hours of what seemed like race baiting, when my audience clapped, that was no joke. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our page on YouTube. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Suzanne Bard. Tardigrades are some of nature's toughest animals. Also known as water bears, the tiny creatures can withstand extreme conditions like boiling hot temperatures, long periods of dehydration, and even oxygen deprivation. One of the really cool things about tardigrades is that you can shoot them in outer space and they can survive the vacuum and radiation of low Earth orbit. University of California San Diego biochemist Jim Kadonaga. Of course, he says tardigrades didn't evolve to endure the perils of space travel. Many tardigrades live in environments that are both wet and dry, like moss. And when it's wet, they're active, and when it's dry, they can go into a desiccated state. That's something like a state of suspended animation. Normally, dehydration would make tardigrade DNA susceptible to damage from chemicals called hydroxyl radicals, which form when water molecules split. They also form when DNA is exposed to radiation. But Kato Naga suspected that a protein found only in tardigrades, called DCEP, might protect their DNA under both conditions. DCEP stands for Damage Suppressor Protein. And the remarkable thing about this DCEP protein is that when you put it into human cells in the laboratory, it makes those cells more resistant to X-ray radiation. Kato Naga's team, led by then-undergraduate student Carolina Chavez, studied how DCEP protects DNA in cells. They found that it binds to chromatin, the compact structure that allows long molecules of DNA to ball up and fit into a tiny cell. The researchers think DCEP acts as a sort of chromatin insulator, shielding DNA from attack by hydroxyl radicals. They conclude that the protein is likely the key to the tardigrade's extreme hardiness in conditions that would prove lethal to most other organisms. The study appears in the journal eLife. Kato Naga says understanding the tardigrade's secret weapon may also inform biotechnology and pharmaceutical research. And so now that we know how DCEP works, we might be able to use that knowledge to make designer versions of DCEP that can be used to potentially make cells more durable or longer lived. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Suzanne Bard. In 2012 in the United States, about 317,000 motor vehicle crashes involved a large truck. 26,000 truck drivers and their passengers were injured in these crashes, and about 700 died. Trucker safety requires an alert, buckled-up, experienced driver with a reliable vehicle and a strong employer safety program. Seatbelts are the most effective way to prevent an injury or death in a motor vehicle crash, But in 2013, one in six drivers of large trucks didn't use their seat belts. Employers can help truck drivers stay safe by committing to driver safety programs at the highest level of leadership, establishing and enforcing driver safety policies, including requiring everyone in the truck to buckle up, and addressing factors that contribute to crashes, such as drowsy and distracted driving. To learn more, visit cdc.gov slash vital signs. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. 
Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution, and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1999. That was the day that 270 workers from the Embassy Vacation Resorts in Maui voted to join Local 5 of the Hotel Employees and Restaurant Employees Union. Local 5 got its start in Hawaii in 1938. Back then, it was called the Hotel and Restaurant Employees and Bartenders International Union. Today, it's a local of Unite Here. Local 5 was part of the surge of union organizing in Hawaii during the 1930s and 1940s. Starting in the 1950s, tourism became increasingly important for the Hawaiian economy. From 1940 to 1957, sugar production jobs on the island declined from 35,000 down to 17,000. With the rise of air travel, more and more jobs opened up in the tourism industry. Today, tourism is the largest gross domestic product of Hawaii. It represents 21% of the Hawaiian economy. Visitors spent $14 billion on the islands in 2012. Yet the service sector workers who made this growth of the tourism industry possible often work long hours for low wages. Many resorts and hotels fight any effort to bring in a union. Such was the case at the Embassy Vacation Resorts. In 1998, the employees voted against forming a union by a count of 126 to 86. The union challenged the results of the election and won. They held a second election the next year. During their organizing drive, four employees were fired at the resort. In 2003, the National Labor Relations Board found that the employees had been let go for their union activities. The company was ordered to reinstate the workers. These legal decisions were victories by the service workers of Hawaii in their fight to win union protections. Like what you hear? Check out more at laborhistoryin2.com. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Monday, October 21st, 2019. I'm Mark Boulanger. The chaos in the UK Parliament caused by right-wing politicians determined to take the country out of the European Union continues. On Saturday, October 19th, the 650 members of Parliament considered a new deal negotiated by Prime Minister Boris Johnson and rejected it. Why the Labour Party considered the deal bad was explained by Rebecca Long-Bailey, the Shadow Minister of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. It's a day on which less than 650 people sat here now will agonise over whether they are about to make the right choice for their communities, industries and future generations. And today they ask themselves, is what is before us today truly a deal which protects and enhances their communities? And sadly, the simple and irreconcilable truth is that it does not. And as the Shadow Secretary of State responsible for business, energy and industrial strategy, I want to make it clear to this House, if agreed, this deal would be a disaster for this country and we must reject it. Mr Speaker, on workers' rights, we simply cannot trust what the Prime Minister is saying. They say this deal protects workers. Yet instead of strengthening protections, they have specifically changed the legally binding withdrawal agreement to remove any commitments on workers' rights. And I think it tells us something, that not a single trade union in this country, not a single one, backs this deal. The TUC say, and I quote, this would be a disaster for working people. Unison have said it would risk every workplace right and leave public services exposed and vulnerable. While Unite say 
by further diluting the legal protections for labour and environmental standards, the Prime Minister has made the laws that underpin workers' rights and public safety extremely vulnerable in future trade deals. Mr Speaker, I could go on, but we should also look at the business case. What does this deal mean for business? Put it simply, for business, for our industries and our manufacturing, it reduces access to the market of our biggest trade partner, threatening jobs up and down our country at a time when more investment is needed, not less. There is no economic impact assessment and no accompanying legal advice. Funny that, I wonder why. Because according to The Guardian, Britain is on course to sacrifice as much as £130 in lost GDP growth over the next 15 years if the Brexit deal goes ahead. And industry has been clear on this. It needs that market access. It needs a customs union to keep vital supply chains flowing. Yet this deal sells them out. No barrier-free access, no customs union. Instead, it puts the fantasy of chasing damaging trade deals with Donald Trump over the needs of our country. Mr Speaker, this deal will add cost and bureaucracy and our companies will face a lack of clarity inhibiting investment and planning. So this is a bad deal for industry, a bad deal for manufacturing and, more importantly, a bad deal for jobs. And, Mr Speaker, this government is asking us to simply trust them on all these issues, quite tellingly without setting out any detail or legislation today. The Prime Minister says nobody in his government wants to reduce rights or standards in this country. Well, that is a remarkable statement, especially when you look at their track record. How can we trust them? So, Mr Speaker, we are about to make history. And in the final moments before we enter those lobbies, MPs will consider the weight placed upon their shoulders. Is this deal right for their communities, industries and future generations? No, it isn't. Agreeing this deal doesn't get Brexit done. Instead, it would sell out our country and sell out our communities, leaving us open to an onslaught of deregulation, reduction of rights, putting jobs at risk. And it's something no Labour MP nor any other MP worried about protecting their community could ever support. And that's it. International Labour News You Can Use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 50 degrees Fahrenheit, cloudy conditions. We are expecting to be a bit warmer than we were yesterday and over the weekend. Uh, had a bit of wet weather. Not so rainy yesterday, though it was overcast and uh, a little drizzly, and but just not heavy rain falling out of the sky. We're going to have some clouds this morning, giving way to generally sunny skies in the afternoon with a high of around 70. Winds will be light and variable all day and into the night with an overnight low in the upper 40s, low 50s, and will be clear to partly cloudy. Lots of sunshine tomorrow, but clouds will be mixed in with another high around 70. Ragweed pollen is moderate locally. Uh, Air quality index is good at 25 parts per million. And that daytime UV index here is rated at 3, which is in the moderate range. Barometric pressure is falling at 30.3 Oh, I'm sorry, I read that wrong. It is rising at 30.31 inches. Visibility is 7 miles and relative humidity is at 95%. So it's still got some water uh, ambient 
in the air indeed weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchase these people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property and these people positively live around the world london is 56 and mostly cloudy paris is 60 degrees and cloudy rome is 80 degrees and sunny kiev is 57 with fog kabul is 60 degrees and partly cloudy Hong Kong is 75 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 60 degrees with rain, and it looks like they have a flood watch because of typhoons. Sydney, Australia is 60 degrees and clear. San Francisco, California is 55 and sunny. And New York, New York is 60 degrees Fahrenheit and sunny. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. At least four people were killed and about 50 injured yesterday Sunday in clashes with police in Bangladesh over a Facebook post that offended Muslims. The clashes in the southern district of Bula, about 120 miles from the capital of Dhaka, broke out when angry crowds protested a Facebook post in which a Hindu reportedly made derogatory remarks about Prophet Muhammad. Police said the Facebook had actually been hacked and all the hackers had been detained. Really, you mean rat efforts. Agent provocateurs. We fired blank shots in self-defense when some people started throwing stones at our officers, forcing us to take shelter in a building, a superintendent of police in Bola said. Four people were killed, and a policeman suffered bullet wounds during the clash. Border guards and additional police have been sent to Bola. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Colin Peckham and Jonathan Barrett of Reuters Bring us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Australia's biggest newspapers ran front pages made up to appear heavily redacted in a protest against legislation that restricts press freedoms in a rare show of unity by the usually partisan media industry. Australia has no constitutional safeguards for free speech, although the government added a provision to protect whistleblowers when it strengthened counter-espionage laws in 2018. Media groups say freedoms remain restricted. Parliament has long been passing laws in the guise of national security that impeded the public's right to know what the government did in its name, the Media, Entertainment, and Arts Alliance said. Journalism is a fundamental pillar of our democracy. It exists to scrutinize the powerful, shine a light on wrongdoing, and hold governments to account. But the Australian public is being kept in the dark, the statement read. Monday's media protest, today being Monday, aimed to put public pressure on the government to exempt journalists from laws limiting access to sensitive Im information, enact a properly functioning freedom of information system, and raise the benchmark 
for defamation lawsuits. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know that Netroots Radio is going to broadcast on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Aster Revoir un latte coel Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver